all of our webinars are recorded and posted on the National Network of Libraries of Medicine YouTube page for future viewing or reference. That will also happen within the next week or two. Everyone who registered for this webinar will receive a link to the recording. I'd like to quickly introduce myself. My name is Bobby Newman, and I am the Community Engagement and Outreach Specialist with the Greater Midwest Region. I connect the public libraries in our 10 state region and across the country. I'd like to add a word or two about who we are if you haven't taken a webinar from the National Network of Libraries of Medicine before. The National Institutes of Health is the nation's leading medical research agency. Many of you might be more familiar with the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases right now. It's one of the institutes and centers at NIH. The National Library of Medicine is also an institute at NIH. It is the world's largest biomedical library, which maintains and makes available a vast print collection and produces electronic information resources such as Medline Plus and PubMed. And NLM is the National Network of Libraries of Medicine, and it is an outreach partner of NNLM, of NLM, excuse me. Mm. And don't let the name fool you, the National Network of Libraries of Medicine is for all types of libraries. We are made up of eight regional, eight geographical regions, and I'm hosting this webinar from the greater Midwest region. With that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Katie and stop sharing my screen so she can get her PowerPoint up. Katie currently serves as the Early Literacy Services Manager at the Gail Borden Public Library. Katie's past positions include children's services at both Midlothian Public Library and Oak Park Public Library. She completed her MLS from Dominican University. She currently serves on the Blue Stem Award Nominating Committee and the Monarch Award Readers Committee for the Association of Illinois School, I'm sorry, School Library Educators. Katie's specialties include early literacy, children's literature evaluation, play-based learning, and best story times. And with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my video and hand it over to Katie. Awesome. Hi, everybody. I'm so excited to be here today. Um, I'm first going to talk a little bit about my library and um, what we're doing right now and give you some information on that, and then we'll start the presentation. So um, I am from Gail Borden Library, which is a northwestern suburb of Chicago. We're a fairly large library system. We have 147,000 in our district. We have one main location and then two branches and also a bookmobile, which is recent the last um, year. Um, and I am one small piece of this puzzle of figuring out what to do in COVID-19. This is all about teamwork and finding people's talents in the library. Um, my specialty is early literacy, story time, and children's literature, but in order to work together, we have to create, we've created a system here called library at home, your library at home, that includes everybody um, at Gail Borden. Another thing I wanted to talk about is this presentation is going to be about all different types of health. Physical health is so important, but also mental health, emotional health, social health. All of these are being challenged right now with us having to stay in. So we as a library have really tried to hit all of these different types of health and not just the physical health. So we're going to be talking about wellness in kind of the broader sense and how to introduce, yes, movement, but also creativity and play. Um, because play is how kids work through grief and um, trauma in a hard situation. So with that being said, I'm going to turn my video off. Um, just because my, uh, just, I get distracted by my own face. Okay. So I'm going to give you an overview of what we're going to talk about today first, so you have an idea of where we're going. We're going to talk about why, the importance of what we're doing. We're going to talk about your library at home, which is our kind of branded virtual programs at Gail Borden Library, as you can see that image right there. We're going to talk about copyright and COVID-19, which is, there's a lot going on right now with that, so we'll talk about the different sides of that debate. 
we're going to go over an overview of what we have done for um, spe specifically focusing on ages zero to six. We're going to talk about how to physically set up um, an online program, both just both physically and digitally and some tips and tricks. We're going to talk about community partners and how we can work with them through this crazy time virtually. Um, and then I'll give you some ideas about how to implement these programs at your library because we have, we've come from all over the place in the country, in the world, and we have come from both big and small libraries. And my philosophy is everyone can do this. The last library I worked at was very small and I was the only children's librarian. So I know what it's like to come from, from both big and small. And then we'll have some time for questions. All right, so why virtual programming? You know, there's so much going on out there. Authors are, are sharing their stories online and there's a plethora of publishers that are giving online curriculum. So why are we doing this? Well, we need to remind people that we are here, right? We are essential workers. We are the face of the library. Um, so we need to offer programs and services as if we are in our building, right? We are reminding people that we are here for them. We're not forgetting about them. Um, also, we need to create a normal, a sense of normal for kids and our own staff. Our staff are kind of in this anxious place. Are we going to have a job? Are we going to be furloughed? What's happening? Um, and creating a purpose for our staff. Um, and a normal routine for them is so important. For kids, we know that they have to have normal routine. So right now, like this baby, if, it's, if it means sitting down and having 25 minutes of, yes, it is screen time, but it is high quality educational screen time, if that creates a sense of normal routine, then we're doing our job. The other thing is to remind people that we are here, like we are a resource. So whenever I do a program, I also try to share where we are, what's happening, um, you know, with our online collections. So we have something called Hoopla. We have um, something called Cloud Library, which is a great resource for eBooks. We have Tumble Books. So any of those things that you are offering, talk about those things in your story times um, and what your plan is. Because we, for example, we just started. Um, drop off and pick up services. So like curbside delivery, we just started that. And we're going, we have a book mobile. And so we are also going to be potentially dropping off books at people's houses. So remind the community that you are here. Also um, promote your summer reading program. I know a lot of people are going digital for summer reading. And so we're going to have to, if we've never done that, walk them through whether that's Beanstack or Read Squared, or if you're doing, um, you know, one that you made and you're posting up on your website, people will need that will need that promotion, and they won't have that face-to-face -face interaction with us maybe during summer reading. So we need to talk about that in our programs also. So now we're going to talk about this thing called your library at home. And basically what this means is this is our branded virtual programs. And the reason that we did this kind of branding is because we wanted a, a space and an image for people to recognize. So on our website, on our banner, you can just click this image, your library at home, and it brings you to a number of things. It brings you to our Facebook page where you can see um, what has been streamed, um, I'll talk about what, how we do our story times and things later on Facebook Live, but it can bring you to our YouTube page. It brings you to the schedule of our upcoming events. So rather than just our, we use Communico, so rather than just our online calendar, they can come to our website, they can come to Facebook and see that image, click on it, and there is all of the programs that we're doing. Um, if you don't have a graphics team, use something like Canva or even Publisher to just create something. It could be whatever you want, virtual story times. It can be very simple as that. And use that as a graphic. You know, people 
gravitate towards images. So use that as a graphic for your story times. Um, and also use what you're already using for your marketing. So we have a newsletter um, that goes out through Constant Contact. We use our social media, both Facebook and Twitter, and also our online calendar. So use the things that people are used to going to. You know, we think we need to reinvent the wheel and like, oh my gosh, how are we going to reach everybody? Well, this is how we reach everybody now. Um, you can be inventive. We're making more um, Facebook events and we are, not all the platforms work well together. You know, Facebook doesn't necessarily interact with YouTube, which does it interact with Zoom. We're finding ways around that. Um, but using all the platforms to advertise. Um, so right now, this is what your library at home looks like. We have a weekly schedule, and then the day goes by like this. We have an 11 a.m. program, and that's always a kid's program. It's not necessarily just uh, a zero to six program. It could be an elementary program, a middle school book talk, but most often it is a story time. Um, then at 2 p.m., we have a Spanish program, a program in Spanish. Our Spanish-speaking population is 40%, and so we definitely need to offer daily, weekly programs in Spanish. This can be a story time or a craft um, or an activity. And then at 7 p.m., we have an adult program, and these are very popular. We've had everything from sewing your own mask to meditation to you know, craft programs for at home where you're grabbing tissue paper and making beautiful um, projects. And this is because we have someone who's very interested in art and we have a community engagement coordinator who is wonderful at trauma-informed care and meditation. So this is all about that teamwork. Um, this daily and weekly schedule will be potentially changing as summer goes by. So we're constantly adapting and analyzing and thinking what to do next. So now we're gonna move to story times um, because story time is the quintessential service for us who work with um, ages zero to six. So I know that this is a huge thing right now going on is how do we deal with copyright and everything that's going on with COVID-19. So a lot of us are familiar with fair use and I put this little graphic of fair use up on the right corner. Fair use, um, the basis of that are these four um, factors, purpose, nature, amount, and the effect on marketing. Um, I have had several conversations with uh, colleagues as well as Carrie Russell, who is the um, ALA copyright specialist at the ALA Public Policy and Advocacy Office. So a lot of information that I'm going to give to you is directly from her, um, just so you can know it's not just my opinion. This is someone who, you know, knows the law and, um, and her, you know, her opinion about this. I will say that, like, the use of copyrighted material is a balancing act, right? It's fair use, the rights of the creators, it's the publishers, the temporary permissions granted during this crisis. And in order to make decisions as a library, um, it's unique to each library. So the decisions that you make regarding the use of creative content are unique. You have to balance all of these things together and then make a decision. Um, here is kind of where we have come to as a library um, in analyzing these four factors. We look at the purpose, okay? So story time is the bread and butter, right? That is, that is what we think of when we think of children in libraries. And what does story time do? Well, it advances literacy and learning. It inspires a love of reading. It builds a commun community of learners, a connection to yourself, a connection to other people, a connection to your local librarian. And these things are wonderful things. Um, secondly, if you think about the effect on the marketing, um, we have purchased this material, right? We don't, we're not monetizing, we're not making money for ourselves by reading aloud. 
And also the effect on the marketing is positive, right? It's not replacing sales. It's actually enhancing sales potentially because if people like the book, they will read it, they will buy it. Um, and so that's, um, that's one thing to think about. There isn't an easy answer. I think one thing to remember is that fair use is flexible in itself and it's open to interpretation. One question is, does COVID-19 change what we consider fair use? I don't know if it necessarily changes, but we, in our current situation, the public can't access library materials, you know? So if we're thinking about the fact that not everyone has access to books and stories right now, we also have to think about our other library principles, intellectual freedom, you know, equity of access, free speech. So in good faith, you know, we know that kids, because of the widespread library closures, kids can't access this. And social distancing is keeping students out of classrooms. So learning is taking place online. Um, so basically what Carrie Russell at ALA says is, this is still a situation where services cannot be provided in person, so adjust adjustments need to be made. In her opinion, even without extenuating circumstances, many on online uses are fair, especially those related to teaching. And that is her words, exactly. Um, so that gives me a little bit of ease of mind. Um, however, the next thing that I'm going to talk about is the fact that publishers still, we still need to follow the guidelines of publishers. So that's what I'm going to talk about next. So publishers are our friends, right? We want, we are going to be working with them for a long time and we want to have a positive relationship. So we want to follow their guidelines um, and have their permission. There is something that is called the SLJ COVID-19 Publisher Information Directory. And I actually am going to show you what this looks like. I'm sure a lot of you maybe have seen this, but it is a gathering, SLJ, a school library journal, has gathered all of the publisher's wishes and guidelines um, in this document. So I can scroll through this. This is most of the big publishers and I can say, oh, okay, well, what is Little Brown saying that, that we should do? And then you can go down and say, look at their guidelines. Please note that you are reading with permission. Post only through their school's platform. Delete within 30 days. Send an email. So we can see what their desires are through this document. Now, um, this is something that I do, every single time I do a story time, I do verbally credit the author and um, the artist when introducing a book or song. And then I do write permission email using the guidelines because again, I, I want to be in a partnership. There are often publishers that of smaller presses that, um, especially before this SLJ uh, information directory was posted, I simply Facebook messaged them or used their contact form, and I did always get a response. So that's another thing that you can do is be unique and just think about um, maybe tweet them, maybe follow them and see how you can um, look in their website. You can also look to stories in the public domain. Um, you know, a lot of things are out there that you can use. Also, one of the things that I do, um, pretty much weekly is I write my own puppet show. So I have a bunch of puppets that I got from my library and, um, or you can use stuffed animals. And what's great about telling your own story is that there is no copyright information. You know, you can use it just wonderfully. Um, and if you study the picture book format a little bit, you can see the formula. So like typically there's a fox and he has a problem. He doesn't know how to dance. So he goes over to his friend Rabbit's house, who is a great hopper, and, and the rabbit teaches him how to hop. Well, then they go to the giraffe, you know? So you can kind of get to know that picture book formula and then study it and start to tell your own stories. Um, again, though, here are some quotes from Carrie Russell. I wanted to mention that. 
Um, and there's this online article entitled Online Storytime and Coronavirus, It's Fair Use, Folks. And um, this also is really, it's chock full of information. Um, and Sarah Osman worked with Carrie Russell on this article. Um, one more quote that I wanted to share was, um, a critical is this, a critical thing to know about fair use it, is that it is by design flexible. So it can accommodate a wide variety of circumstances. There is growing consensus among copyright experts that posting online story times to continue mission-driven library and educational services during the coronavirus emergency is fair use. So that being said, should we jump through the hoops of the publishers? To me, yes, we should, because we want to be a good partner. Also, um, we need to think about the intellectual freedom and the access to information. So. Unfortunately, I don't have an answer for you. I think that it is important to remember all of our principles and then come to a conclusion for ourselves. So again, my best practices are these things. I always do these things. I thank them. We always make sure that we have purchased it. Um, you can try to use a closed platform. I know that not everyone can um, afford Zoom accounts. So it's really hard. Sometimes you have to use the things that you have. So you might not be able to use a closed fat platform. Um, and, and one thing that's a nice gesture is to tag them on social media. It's that next step of going to their Facebook page or their Twitter and then tagging them. They like to see what we're doing. And, and it's great. It's great um, marketing to be using their, their author's work. Okay, so now we're gonna get into the fun stuff. What we are doing and how. So some of this is going to be new for you and maybe some, maybe you're already doing this. So this is a really fun thing, virtual dance parties. Um, this gets you up, gets you moving, and the kids can join all the way from their home screen. So this is an example of one of them. This is roy a royal dance party. And what you can do is you can present this in a Zoom meeting, not in a webinar, which we are right now, which you can't see anybody. You would do this via a Zoom meeting, and then you would have the children register, or the grown-ups of the children, register through either Zoom, or we do our online calendar. So we have people register in our, our Communico, or Evanced, or whatever it is that you use. Then we set up the Zoom meeting, and then the morning of the program, we push that out to everyone who has registered for the program. And then they come on and they can decide to use their camera if they want, or they can decide not to and just participate as, um, you know, not, not with their video on. Either way is fine. And then um, what we do, so for this one, they learned a dance. And then um, we did a little book. And when we do the book, what I did is I downloaded the ebook onto my computer via Hoopla. Then I did a screen share with the kids, and they could take a dance break, sit down. I screen shared and scrolled through, just clicked through the ebook and read it out loud. Um, so, and then you stop the screen share, and then you go back to the dance party. So we, we even got to do a little bit of stories, which was great. Um, and then what we also had was Anna and Elsa came and visited us, and that was from a local performance group. Um, so we hired them, and um, they each were in their own respective homes, and they, um, the kids could ask questions to Anna and Elsa, which you do, we needed an administrator for this because we muted and unmuted the kids. So we set it initially as we muted everyone. And then as kids had questions, they asked them in the chat box. And then we unmuted them and they could ask their questions. You know, like, what's it like to live in Frozen? And then the, the, um, the performers would answer. So it is some logistical things. We always have three people in the Zoom room. So it, again, it's staff work. Um, 
but I, it went well, it's worth it in the end. The kids also got to twirl in front of the camera. So depending how many kids you have, you can say, oh no, oh, Jessica, come and give your, give the, the camera a twirl so everyone can see you. Oh, how fun. Um, and we really get them moving. Another example we had was a dinosaur dance party. So this is kind of what it looks like. They can decide, obviously, what if they want to do gallery view where they see everybody or they want to do presenter view where they just see the presenter um, or the person speaking right now. And so this is my colleague, Miss Cindy, and she has puppets and a little costume. And this is her um, presenting at the dino dance party. So another thing is kind of these act, more active or um, creative story times that use movement and or um, we also have some mental health, which we'll get into. So this was our dance story time, and this was a pre-recorded on Facebook, so not Facebook Live. Um, pre-recorded Facebook has some advantages because you can, like in this one you see on the bottom left-hand corner, it says plie. So you can write the word, you know, you can design it with your own graphics, you can time it out, you can cut out your dog jumping up on you, which is what happened to me. <laughs> um, and so that's nice for recorded. However, we have found that recorded story times do not get as much, as many views. Facebook Live, for some reason, our audience really likes that more. I think it's part of being in the audience and being there right now. Um, and seeing the librarian's face. I think that's part of it, know that, knowing that they are right there. So we, in this story time, we read a book. I talked about the type of, of dance. So I printed out pictures from my computer and talked about ballet and jazz and tap and Indian dance and African dance and the types of costumes and shoes from different cultures. Um, and I did this just by printing out things, you know, and showing the camera, oh wow, this is, a dancer from India and this is her costume. So it's not necessarily that you have to know a whole bunch of stuff. Um, it's using what you have. And then they got to practice their, what they learned at their dance story time. So I made a, a link. Um, you can click it. I can send out these, this PowerPoint after we are all done. You can see have these links. All right, so then we did a kindness story time. And this was focused on emotions and our emotional care. So we talked about self-care. We talked about caring for the earth and other people. So I, I read a book focused on just kindness in general. And then I read a book called 10 Ways I Can Help My World. And that one is great because even in COVID-19, we can do things to help our world. So I brought my phone around my room, my uh, house, and said, oh, I'm gonna recycle this piece of paper and look at, there's a light on. I'm gonna turn out the light. Um, and then I brought out a kindness bear, that, which was a bear from my childhood that I just dug out of my garage and talked to the bear um, and about what it's like to be kind and the bear's ideas about kindness and what it's like to care for yourself also. I did a story time on food, fun food, nutrition. Um, I read two books. One is called Go, Go Grapes, which is all about fruit, and then did a taste test with an elephant. So I brought out five different fruits, and I tried them myself, and then got to use very you know rich vocabulary, like sweet and sour and bitter and salty and grainy. All those words are great to introduce kids. Um, and then I fed it to the elephant and we talked about the elephant and what an elephant eats. Um, and of course the elephant loved the fruit. <laughs> and then I read the book, Is That Wise Pig by Jan Thomas, which is super fun. And then we made a silly stew. And this was just using um, a big popcorn bowl and throwing things in it, like literally I threw in a Cubs baseball, a fan, a gummy bear, like really silly things around my house. Um, so again, this is not stuff that I'm, you, I'm going to the library to get. I'm looking around my house and being like, hmm, I wonder what 
kids would like in my house. Let's take a sculpture um, and let's take a painting and talk about art and different types of art in Miss Katie's house. It's that kind of thing. Um, another thing that you could do is a video about an obstacle course in your house. This is really fun to get the blood pumping. When I did this, I was out of breath. So um, you could encourage people to use anything you have around the house. Cardboard boxes. Literally, if you have a cardboard box and a kid jumps in it and out it over and over, that's a workout. Um, if you put four chairs together and sheets from your bed, you can make a crawl tunnel. You can do like this boy's doing and just string or crepe paper. You can go under and over. You can put books or cones or I brought my picnic cooler and weave around them. Um, and then you can do simple things like a start and a finish and then come up with a challenge like five jumping jacks, three burpees, jumping, um, all kinds of things like that. And you can make a video or you could do like a downloadable PDF of ideas and put it on your website. There's all kinds of different ways of communicating how to do this thing. Another thing that we have not done yet, which is why I don't have a picture, but this is something that we are doing this summer. Um, it is for ages zero to two and they're grown up. We've limited to 15 registrants just to see how it goes. Um, so what it's going to be, it's called Parent Cafe plus, plus Baby Play. And on Monday, the parents are going to pick up a toy, like a baby toy or an activity. So it would be something like Play-Doh, um, a rattle, things like that, plus a board book to keep. And then on Fridays, the parents will meet via Zoom. And while their baby plays with that activity in the book, the parents are encouraged to discuss things together, how they're feeling about COVID-19, um, how they're dealing, and then also having a specialist um, come and talk. And I will, so these are the people that we have planned so far. We have a sleep specialist. We have um, manager of our early learning organization. She specializes in daycare. She knows every daycare. And people might wanna know that soon um, if they have an infant a doula, a mental health specialist, a nutritionist. Now, right now, all these people are donating their time, um, which is an incredible gesture. Um, they are getting, you know, they're getting some marketing and getting to know people in their community. So that's great. It's a good partnership. Um, we might, you know, who knows in the future, we might have to use some of our programming money to pay. We also have thought about baby yoga, a music therapist, a nurse from a hospital, a car seat safety specialist, a baby proofing specialist. So these are all ideas um, of people that the parents could talk to about a, you know, a baby discussion every week. I will say that um, we are allocating programming money that we would have used for the toy activity and board book. There is um, the dollar store it's, I think it's the Dollar Tree. If you have the Dollar Tree, you can order board books for 99 cents and it comes with a CD. So go on the Dollar Tree if you're looking um, for board books that you could have as giveaways. And also Amazon has lots of things that are, um, you know, you can get in bulk that, and like Play-Doh, for example, um, that is somewhat cheap. Also, I didn't know this, but if you work with your, um, finance department, or if you can set, if you have multiple people, you can send on Amazon that you can have one giant order and send them to multiple people, multiple people's houses. So that I didn't know that until recently. Another thing that you could do and we have done are pairing um, professionals in the area with a story time for kids. So it's kind of like part adult parent caregiver, part for kids. So this is an example. This is my colleague, Tish, who is wonderful. She works with the community and she spoke with a mental health professional via Zoom. So what they did is they recorded their interview via Zoom. And this was all about COVID-19 and how to help children 
manage um, and parents manage their feelings and everything that's going on because this is honestly traumatic for both um, kids and parents. And I think a lot of us are starting to see that right now. So talking with a mental health professional and seeing that interview recorded is great. And then that was edited, paired together with a story time that I did um, that it wasn't specifically like these, this is a mental health book. I think I read a book called Say Hello, um, Say Hello Like This. And so I talked about how different animals say hello different ways and we all feel things differently. And then I talked about with this rabbit puppet, I talked to parents about, you know, kids don't always know how to say their feelings. They don't have the words, especially when talking to a grown up or to someone else, but a puppet can be less intimidating. A puppet can be inviting. And if you bring a puppet to your child, they could be more likely to open up. I mean, it's Mr. Rogers, right? Um, and so I just gave tips and tricks for things like that. Um, that is actually, that will be posted on our website on Sunday. It hasn't been posted yet. Other ideas that we've thought about are you could interview a dentist, a police officer, a firefighter, and then do a story time um, on that. You know, kids love firefighter books and um, you could do a how to brush your teeth demonstration. So think about the people in your community that you could still use um, and pairing it with a story time. Also, you want to think about what community partners that you have that, yes, um, it's difficult now, but they, a lot of people are great with Zoom and technology. Um, so we had a mindful and relaxation with a local med meditation specialist, and he did, um, he did that for us. We also have local places that can promote our program. So how can you get your information out to the daycares, to the local school? Ask the school, what do they need? You know, do they need, we don't want to duplicate services. Like we have thought about, do we need to do a, uh, a Zoom tutorial for people? And the feedback we got was, no, these people are doing uh, Zoom already. Like it's Zoom crazy out there. They already know that platform. We don't need to do a how-to because everyone's using it. Um, so what do they actually need? And then reaching out to performers. A lot of performers are hurting right now and they can use anything that we can give them. So allocating money to performers and doing a virtual concert um, is great. So I'm gonna talk about logistics now. Um, this is my setup. So this is where I am right now. Um, I, when I do story times, I use my phone. Phone for me is always a better connection than the computer. I one, did a story time once and it lagged. So it was the whole like me talking, but two seconds later, there's my voice. And I had to re-record that using my phone because it had a better connection. So that's just something that has worked for me. I clearly just stack craft containers and books on top of each other and make sure my phone is steady. I have no recording system, no microphone, nothing. So you can do this, I promise you. Um, another thing that you can do is test it out. So you can go like on your personal profile and then say, I want to do Facebook Live, but only to Natalie. And then Natalie watches it, but no one else can see it. So you can test it to make sure that it's what it is that, that it's not lagging. You can look at the lighting. You can see, hey, do I want to be really close to the screen or am I more comfortable further away? Or maybe I want to be in a rocking chair. Hey, can the kids see the text? Can they see the illustrations? Um, that's a great thing to know. I didn't know you could do Facebook Live to one person. Um, also, there's this way to flip to, to selfie mode, but also the text is not reversed. Now, there's a couple steps to this, and I'm not going to be able to demonstrate it right now. Um, but I'm happy if people email me, I can send them a screenshot. I've done this to people, so I can forward it on to you. So here's my setup. As you can see, nothing special. Um, okay, a lot of us know these things, um, but with a camera in front of us, it's just strange. There's no, we're doing story times to no one. And so how do you emotionally connect between you and the audience when it's you in your room with just a camera? 
I say pretend that that camera is a child. Just look into them like it's looking to a child's eyes. Now we do our story times via Facebook, and now we are looking to go to Facebook or to Zoom, but using the, what's called an overflow room to Facebook Live. And there's a couple steps to this. I can definitely refer you to our social media specialist who knows all of the logistics. But basically what it is, is you do a Zoom webinar and it simultaneously streams to Facebook, which means that you could have registration and people go into the Zoom room or you can just have them go to Facebook Live. Um, so I will say that that's the way we do our story times. Um, make sure that you are articulating and that you have great diction because sometimes the computer sucks out the noise. Um, because of our Facebook Live, I can see comments as people go by. So because I'm in selfie mode, I can see Adriana says hello, and then I'll say hello, Adriana. Um, if I'm doing like a little mouse, little mouse, are you in the blue house? I can ask them to guess answers in the comments field and I'll say, oh my gosh, Brandon, you were right. Um, so it's great if you can actually get some, some interaction with the kids via the comment form. I still do things like early literacy tips. I always try to share something from my life because it's like that kid when, when they see a a teacher in a grocery store, right? It's so weird. Well, it's also great. Um, if kids can see it, like they've seen my doggy and they've seen my windows. And um, also think about your role. For me, like I feel sometimes powerless in this whole thing and knowing that my role as a presenter, it kind of keeps me alive. Like, okay, I am doing something of value people are responding. It just makes me feel like, okay, this is, this is how I'm helping. Like this is my role right now um, in, the, in the pandemic. And kids have a, naturally, a natural ability to heal and give themselves the resilience to work th through stress, but they need things like story time, right? We know that they need a sense of control. They need to see characters playing out their own narrative. They need to see characters who express emotions and make decisions. Stories do these things. So we need to keep doing them. Also make it personal. So one of the things that we've done at Gail Borden is do birthday greetings. So um, every Monday, I give a shout out. I sing happy birthday to anyone whose birthday it was that week. Parents can email um, this email address that we've made. And then I say happy birthday, just another way to personalize it. Also offer activities for screen-free time. That's what I, I think screen-free time is also a very important. So ideas um, for helping, having kids help at home. One thing that a local library in Illinois is doing, which I think is fabulous, is making like three-minute videos for just an activity that doesn't require a parent. So one of them, for example, is duct taping down figurines, you know, like, Barbies, anything like that, duct tape them down super, super hard, and then see how long it takes for the kids to unduct tape them. That's great. Um, art projects. And then we have this calendar um, called Getting Ready for Kindergarten, and it has a daily early literacy tip. So any way that you can get like a daily tip out there, whether it's Facebook or an online um, like constant contact, and um, yeah, just remember that share your stories. People love to see you. Here's just a list of books that are my go-tos. Um, for your library, I suggest that you start with what you have. So what do you have at home? I had stuffed animals. Luckily, I had a printer. So things like magnet boards. Um, I don't have a laminator, but I just hold up the thing, the picture, and kids like to see those and put it on a craft stick if you don't have a puppet, right? You can just print out a dog on a craft stick and that's a puppet right there. I took our refrigerator to do board and I happened to have just random chunks of felt and I made a felt board. Um, remember the ebooks are there. 
You can encourage people to, if you don't have, if they don't have an egg shaker at home for the egg shaker song, get out the pots and pans, make a, take a pill bottle or vitamin bottle and have them shake it. Um, Remember that food is always there. You can teach about food and um, our finger plays and stretching songs are always can be our go-tos. And then add on what you can. So find out your library's policy on visiting the library if you're if you can. So I visited once, maybe twice now, and I just take a load. Um, and then can you use your programming funds? Can you repurpose them to do at home story time items? So what, what we're thinking this summer is our hope is we have a drive-through window, but we're also thinking like how do we do curbside pickup for giving out some kind of bag that has a scarf, an egg shaker, a belt, or something. So at home, they can participate via something that we have given to them. The logistics aren't worked out yet, but that is our plan. So you'd register, you'd come and pick up the story time bag, and then you have those materials for the weekly story time. And you'd only have to do that one time. They'd only have to come one time, and our session is eight weeks. Um, and then, you know, measuring your impact, this is hard because how do you measure? How many kids add to your attendance? Um, do you measure by the number of views or the number of shares? Like, that's very hard and we're still figuring it out. Right now, um, I think we are tracking the number of views at, in our kids' department like 24 hours after. Um, so that's like the quantitative. But I think we focus too much on numbers and, and libraries in general, and we need to think about the qualitative and look at the comments and look at the how, you know, how many registrations do you have? Are you getting thank yous? Um, those types of things, um, people, it's to know that you really do appreciate, that you really are appreciated. And people have shared um, pictures, which is so wonderful. You know, we are building a strong community virtually. It doesn't feel the same, but um, it's hard because you can't see them. So I love it to see, like, here's a, here's a shout out, here's a photo. Um, I don't think we have time for this because I'd like to keep uh, time for questions, but um, I can send these to Bobby and she can send them out with the links and you can also go to Gail Borden's library at home YouTube playlist if you just search that in YouTube you can see all the programs that I'm talking about plus hundreds of more programs that we have done so um, at this point I think I'm all done and I am open to any questions great thank you so much Katie uh, yeah I've been grabbing some questions um from the chat. And so uh, I think this is the one I hear anytime I do a webinar right now is, um, what are you doing to prevent Zoom bombings? Oh, yes. Okay. Um, we've, we've done research on this. Um, and we are, there's, there's lots of like up and down and up and down. We have, it hasn't happened to us, but we are requiring passwords. So we send out the password and um, it's also live streamed to Facebook. So if that were to ever happen, I think um, what we would do is we would shut the Zoom room and then immediately go to the Facebook live streaming if that happened. But right. we, do, we do have them password protected. Okay, that was my question, yep. Okay, so you okay. password protected, great. Um, so the next question is, um, I think that that is that, but um, how many registrations are you allowing for the virtual dance parties? So um, we are, our registration is for a hundred, but the last two we've only gotten, let's see, I think we had 45 registrants, but then like 75 kids because they were brother and sister. And then every time we did something personal, we said, put your kids' names in the comments if you have a question or if you'd like our kids to shout out. So we have one coming up and we have like 30. And at that point, I think we could mute and unmute. Um, I would say 30 would be the max for like having kids individually do something. Great. Yeah. That's, um, how do you, so that leads sort of kind of the next question. How do you track attendance when you do these? You talked about a brother and sister. It's crazy. 
It's crazy. Um, so for our Zoom events that are not on Facebook Live, we look at the number of registrants, but then we have, an, we have a person who is viewing the comments, kind of how you are, Bobby, and viewing the screens, and she counts. So she'll see, like, okay, is there two kids and a parent? And she'll count um, for that. For Facebook Live, this is what I'm saying, it's impossible. So different departments are doing different things in kids space. It's like we look at the number of views like 24 hours later because that's about the time. But then we notice another, like by the end of Saturday, there's 700 more views or whatever. So like where do you track it and when do you track it and, and write down the number for attendance? that's up to you. I mean, it's, it's, that's the hardest thing. I would say whenever's the most. <laughs> yeah. We have that problem too with, um, with our webinars because this is happening right now and I can see how many people are attending live, but it will be uploaded to YouTube. Yes. Um, and a lot of people uh, register to get that link when it comes out. So, right. Yep. I, I definitely feel that. <laughs> I would say that the best thing that you can do is try to have like a co-host and you can make anyone a co-host and try to have two people. I know that's not always possible, but it's really hard to monitor two things at once. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, always have a, a, a co-host if you're the person. Yes. Helps a lot. Uh, so for the virtual dance parties, um, what are, or how are you selecting the music? Is there an issue with the public performance rights? What are you using? Yes. Um, I could screen share this, but I'll see if I can look it up. There is a, um, a website. I don't know if anyone, knows, I'm sure we have people from Colorado here, but the cloud bell is, um, an amazing resource. And, um, yes. Okay. I will just screen share this really quick so I can show you what it is that I'm talking about. Um, okay. I hope everyone can see. There is this thing on the Cloba website called, let's see if I can, ah, it's music for, for help, music help for streaming story time. And this is, it looks like my computer is being slow. It's a list of all the musicians that have said, here's how you use my music if you want to use it. Um, some are kind of revising, like I know Miss Carol, she's from Chicago, Carol Stevens has now on her website said for 20 streams, um, can you pay $10 or something for unlimited streams? Can you pay me $20? And it's, it's loading. Ah, if you Google Clow Bell, um, music for streaming story times, it has a list. So it says like Jim Gill says you can use his story times or his music. So it's just a list of, of, of musicians. Otherwise, use your finger plays or sing a song um, because the music copyright is way different than the um, book copyright. Like you do wanna be really loyal to those musicians because that's their original work and it's not through an agent and a publisher. Great, thank you. And let's see. Um, someone that we always get this too. I should have grouped this earlier. Someone is worried that even though they have people register and they do a password, if you're using Zoom, which ha which has the option for people to turn on the camera and mute themselves, that they might get things that are inappropriate. Right. That's really hard. I, I we've talked about this numerous times in our uh, library meetings, and uh, like the only thing I can say is. You, if you have an administrator watching these different people, you might not catch it, but if it's a repeated behavior over and over, you instantly turn off their camera. Um, you can't prevent everything, and it's like balancing providing the service and potentially having that happen or not doing it at all. Um, I will say that, yes, like I can see that a crazy person could register and then do something horrible, but it's, it hasn't happened yet. I'm not saying it won't. Um, we'd probably reevaluate if it did happen. Great. Thank you. Um, and then I've got a, um, a question. When you do gallery view in Zoom, do you need to get parental permission to show the children's faces? 
That's a great question. So here's what we do at the beginning. We say, um, this story time, it like if we record it too, which I don't think we're going to record it. I don't think there's any reason to. Um, we say, please note that this, um, that, you know, you can see everybody. So if you do not want your child to be viewed by other people, please turn off your camera because we understand that this, the privacy, you need to keep your own privacy. You can participate just like you can, they could see anybody too, um, but just they wouldn't see themselves. Great, great. All right, we've got um, about two minutes left. And so I know that there's still some questions that aren't answered, but I am gonna go ahead and wrap up and respect everyone's time so we can end on time. Um, thanks, Katie, that was a lot of great information um, in, in the hour that we had. I think it's given everybody some great ideas. Good, and so, I'm open to email if people wanna email me. Yes. Um, so I am going to just remind everyone that your best source for information on COVID-19 is the CDC website. Um, it's being updated continuously. In particular, I like this section on the daily life and coping during the time of COVID-19. I think I saw several comments in the chat box, but this is a stressful time for everyone, including library employees. And so I think that there's really good information here. Um, I particularly um, enjoy that they have a section on animals in addition to children. Um, so it's stressful for our pets as well. <clears throat> what next? If you're not a member of the National Network of Libraries of Medicine, please consider joining. Um, this it is sort of a um, misdirection in the name. The, the, the network is for everyone. Membership is institutional, not individual. So if your library is already a member, you're all set. You can sign up for more free webinars and asynchronous online classes from the National Network of Libraries of Medicine at nnlm.gov training. And just a reminder that this webinar was being recorded today. In a week or two, you will receive an email with a link to the recording, a survey asking for your feedback on the presentation, and instructions on how to claim a CE certificate or a certificate of attendance. Um, I will get those processed and get them out to you as soon as I'm able. Um, so please be patient. We're doing the best we can here. Um, and with that, I am going to hit stop sharing. Thanks for watching. This video was produced by the National Network of Libraries of Medicine. Select the circular channel icon to subscribe to our channel. Select a video thumbnail to watch another video from the channel.